morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How today? Okay. So you can wear a Santa Claus hat if you have one. Okay. So this is 5.1 area and distance. We're going to talk about area and distance. So if you have a continuous curve, that means there's no break on this interval A to B, then what will be this area? Suppose this is a positive function. What will be this area under the curve? So today we're going to investigate on that. So first of all, uh, say this is a continued curve, x squared. This function here is the x squared function. From 0 to 1, the green shaded area will be the area under the curve, right? Now, we don't have a formula for this area right now. Uh, we know a formula for rectangle, length times width, give me the area. So what we do over here is we're going to break it down into different slices. And each slice here, we're going to approximate that using rectangle. So over here, I slice it. Okay, so from 0 to 1, I divide it into four subintervals, each one with equal width, delta x. And then for each slice here, I'm going to approximate that by one rectangle. And when I sum up those rectangles, the area for those rectangles, that will be an approximation to the area under the curve. Now, if I use four of them, it looks like the, it's an estimate. It's an approximation to the area, but it's not a very good approximation. I can input that by dividing this interval into subinterval with smaller width. So make delta x to be smaller. I, and I got this. The sum of those area of the rectangle will be a better approximation. Now I actually decrease delta x more. Okay, I get more rectangle. And the sum of those will be a better approximation. And then over here, I even uh, divide this interval into more subinterval with equal width. So make delta x to be even smaller. It looks like those, the sum of those rectangles are getting very close to the area under the curve. So you can imagine this process right here, okay? Continue this way. So, and, and later we're gonna divide the area as the area under the curve as the limit of those, sum of those rectangles as, as you make this delta x to be smaller and smaller. This is the idea, okay? So over here, we're gonna subdivide this region over here into n stripes with equal width delta x. So delta x is the width for each sub in the world. So delta x will be the total length, which is b minus a, divided by n, because we divide that into n sub in the world. So b minus a divided by n, that's delta x. The second step here, we're gonna approximate each stripe with a rectangle. So like this stripe right here, this stripe right here underneath the curve, we're gonna approximate that by this pink rectangle over here. And we're gonna use the value of the function at the right end, right end point as the height of this rectangle. So for example, in this rectangle, I take this right end point and use this y coordinate of this right end point as the height for this rectangle. So the height here times the width here give me this area for this rectangle. You see, I take the right end point, take the right end point, and using that height, for the length for the rectangle, and the width will be delta x. So the first rectangle over here will take this, the y coordinate at this point, which is f of x1, and then times the width here will be delta x. So f of x1 times delta x give you the area for this first rectangle. f of x2 times delta x give you the area of the second rectangle. And the last one over here, f of xn times this delta x, that's the area for the last rectangle over here. Now notice I divide this, this interval a to b into n subinterval. Uh, so this a here goes one to x0, x1, x2, and then um, this, the last one, the b here is xn. And then you're gonna sum up those rectangles, right? Sum up those rectangles, so you sum this up. To sum this up, we have this summation side right here. Now suppose you haven't seen this before. Uh, let me explain that to you. This is called the sigma notation. 
you sum this all of this up, see there's a pattern. All of them have delta x. So put delta x over here. Every change here is actually f of x x1, this is f of x2, this is the last one is f of xn. So the index over here change from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 all the way to n. So we're using i over here. Okay, so we use the i over here to stand for the index. And the i here start from 1 and end at n. So i go from 1 to n. And from 1 to the next one, you always increase the index by 1. Okay, 1 and then to 2 to 3 and all the way to n. And then you stop when you reach n. And the, this is the sigma notation here means you're taking the sum. Okay, you're sum, summing f of x1 delta x and then plus f of x2 times delta x, and then you put this f of x3 times delta x, etc. This tell us, a sigma notation tell us to add, and this this one down here tell us we start i here go from 1, and this one here, we tell, uh, this tell us to end with i equal to n. So this is just a notation for the sum over here. Now, we're going to define the area under the curve as the limit of the sum. Now I use that R over here. This is what uh, this R here stands for using the Y M point as a high for those rectangle. Using the Y M point, the Y coordinate of the Y M point as a high of those rectangle. And I have N of those rectangle, right? So I call this R N. So it is some of those, the area of those N rectangle using the Y M point for the high. The y coordinate y endpoint as a height. So we define the exact area under the curve as the limit of this. And as you see from the diagram over here, when you let n go to infinity, those rn is going to approach to the area under the curve. Right? Okay. Actually, yeah, you can see over here. Okay. So this is a diagram. Now, instead of using the y endpoint, okay, so over here, we're using the y endpoint and using the y coordinate of that for the high for each rectangle, we can also use the left endpoint. So over here is an example using the left endpoint. So we divide that into four subinterval, but this time we took the left endpoint for the y coordinate for the endpoint for the high. And then we found the area for each rectangle. Now notice that here, the leftmost rectangle has collapsed because the high for this rectangle it is zero. But that's okay. Okay, you could you could, that could happen. Now notice that what happened here when you let n here increase, then the area for those n rectangle is also getting closer and closer to this exact area under the curve. Okay, so you can use the right end point or use the left end point. You can also use the middle point. So for each sub interval, instead of taking the left end point, the right end point uh, for the height. You can also take the middle point and using the y coordinate, the middle point over here for the height. Okay, and then we find the area for each rectangle. Also, you can use any arbitrary point. For example, over here on the first sub interval, I pick x1 to be this. Uh, because x1 is reserved for this, this end of this sub interval, so this, the x coordinate for this. Uh, I'm going to use x1 star. The star over here just indicate that it is a sample point. Okay, so the star here says that this is a sample point in the first subinterval. So x1 star is a sample point in the first subinterval. x2 star is a sample point in the second subinterval, etc. So do not be intimidated by those sim uh, those notation. Okay, the star just means it's an arbitrary point, a sample point in this subinterval. And then we use that point, the y coordinate here as a high and then times the width, which is delta x. So the y coordinate for those, those sample point right here. So f of x i star that correspond to the y coordinate of this point. Then you times the width, which is delta x. So that will give you the area for one rectangle. And now you're going to sum up n of them. So i go from 1 to n. So that will be the sum of those n rectangles. 
This is called a we mind sum. Okay, we mind sum right here. Okay, now you take the limit as n go to infinity. Okay, just like what you have done over here, you let n go to infinity. That will approach to this we mind sum is going to approach the exit area under the curve. Okay, question. Not yet. Okay, that's good. So using the uh, right end point, that's Rn, that's the sum of those n rectangles. Using the left end point, the sum of those n rectangles is called Ln. Using the middle point, the sum of those n rectangles is called Mn. This is an example point over here. Okay, this is uh, is a we mind sum. Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you in the homework, uh, you're gonna be asked this question. So suppose you have an increasing function. Okay, if you're using the y endpoint for the height of this those rectangle, so Rn will be an overestimate or underestimate of the area under the curve. Uh, underestimate. Uh, using over. the y endpoint, under or overestimate. Over. It's an overestimate because the y endpoint is the highest point in in the each sub interval, right? So when you use the y coordinate of that. Then this rectangle is going to above this, this stripe right here, right? So you have this extra area above the curve. So it is an overestimate. So that will be overestimate, okay? And if you use the left end point, the left end point is the lowest point in each sub interval. So that will be an underestimate, okay? Okay, now vice versa, uh, if you have a decreasing function, Using the y endpoint, that would be what? Under or overestimate? Under. Under, yeah. Underestimate, okay, so that would be underestimate. And using the left endpoint, that would be overestimate. Okay, now in this example, we are trying to use four rectangles to find an no estimate. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay, so we use one rectangle to find a lower SMA and then upper SMA for this area under this curve. So they give you the curve, and I also give you the coordinate for those endpoints right here. Okay. So first, I'm going to have, uh, let's try to find a lower SMA. Okay. So what's delta x over here? What's the width for each uh, sub interval? Two. Two, two, right? Okay, yeah. you got it. Okay, so that is two. Okay, so lower SMA. So using the left end point or the right end point, it's Doesn't an matter. increasing function. So we take the left end point. Okay, mm -hmm. so it will be L. I'm using four rectangles, so L4. And then this is L here, so L4, left end point. Now that's equal to. <clears throat> Okay, the first rectangle over here, the left hand point, the y coordinate is four. Mm -hmm. So we have four. Delta x over here, it is um, equal to, well, just a different color, equal to two, okay? So times two, okay? Maybe I'll just use the color, times two, okay? <clears throat> the second one over here, the second rectangle, the left hand point is 4.8. The y coordinate is 4.8, so 4.8 times the width, which is two. Okay, what about the next one? 5.1, right? Mm -hmm. Times two. And then the last one will be 5.3 times two. Okay, so I'm using four rectangle. Then I'm using the left hand point for the height. And because this is an increasing function, so the left hand point here is the lowest point in each sub interval. So this is this will be a lower estimate. And if I sum this up, I got 68.4. So the lower estimate for the area under the curve will be this. Okay. What about upper estimate? Uh, upper estimate. Okay. So upper estimate. Uh, this time I will use the right end point. Then you similarly, this time on this sub interval, I will take the right end point. The right end point is this. So we use 4.8 for the y coordinate 
but the, we use 4.8 as the height of the of that rectangle. Okay. And then times two, and then 5.1 times two, and then 5.3 times two, and also 5.5 times two. Do the calculation, so that's equal to 41.4. So this is an overestimate, this is an underestimate, so the exact area and the so the exact area under the curve is going to be between these two numbers. Okay, somewhere between these two numbers. So you can try to maybe you can take the average of these two and to approximate the area under the curve. Okay. Now the next example is the cosine function. Okay, so this is the curve for cosine function from zero to power two. And they ask you to try to estimate the area under the curve. Okay. Uh, how about we use, um, let's try to use four rectangle to approximate that, okay? So I'm going to divide this, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna divide this into four equal part, into four sub interval, each with equal width. Um, so that will be, what's delta x? Can someone tell me what's delta x? Pi over eight? Yes, pi over eight, okay? So delta x over here will be equal to, the width for this interval is power two. Then we divide that into four sub interval. So that will be power, that will be equal to pi over eight, right? So power eight is this, okay? And then this is power eight. So the next one here will be pi over, pi over four. And you keep on adding power eight. So this will be three pi over, eight, right? Okay, and then power two. And then you're going to use, um, so you're going to divide. Let's use the ym point, okay? So let's think about r4. I use four sub interval. So I use four rectangle. So that's equal to, what does it equal to? Using the ym point, so this will be the area and for the first rectangle, right? And then this is the area for the second and third. And the last one over here collapsed though, because the high it is zero, okay? So for the y m point, let's find the y coordinate for each y m point. This is cosine of pi over eight, right? Okay, it's cosine of pi over eight. And this one over here is cosine of pi over four. This one over here is cosine of three pi over eight. This one over here, the y coordinate is cosine of pi over two, which is equal to zero. So it collapses with zero, okay? Delta x over here is equal to pi over eight. So each one here is going to be pi over eight. Okay, now if I use, uh, so when I find the sum of those four rectangles using the y m point, so we have cosine of pi over eight, times the width, which is going to be pi over eight, adding cosine of pi over four times pi over eight plus cosine three pi over four, three pi over eight times pi over eight times the width. And then the last one is cosine of pi over two and then times pi over eight. Now, cosine of power two, it is going to be zero, okay? And then you can use a calculator, okay? So all of this, so you use a calculator. Whatever number you come up with, okay? You can do the at home. Is it underestimate or overestimate? Under. Under. Underestimate, okay? Because it's a decreasing function. So this one here will be an underestimate for the area under the curve. So that's what I'm gonna do for homework, okay? Okay, so the next one, the distance problem, let me briefly go over this, okay? Now we know that distance is rate times time when you travel um, at a constant rate, okay? Or, or this is an average rate, okay, rate times time. Now suppose the diameter on your car is broken and we want to estimate the distance driven over a 30 second time interval, uh, we can take the speed 
speedometer reading every five seconds. You might wonder why do you want to do that? Okay. Okay. So, and then you read it every five seconds. Okay. So, every five seconds you read that <laughs> reading. Okay. Now, what happened over here? Okay. Now, remember, for this one, this formula over here. Okay. This is equal weight times time. The rate over here, it is the constant velocity or average velocity, average rate. Okay. Now, over here, now you read the, the speedometer every five seconds. Okay. And you got this number. Okay. Now, in order to have the time of velocity in consistent unit, let's convert the velocity reading to feet per second. And then you're going to convert that mile into feet per second. Okay. So they did the conversion for you. Okay. Using this. Okay. So, so every five seconds you read the reading and then um, this is in uh, feet per second. So that will be the velocity. Okay. At that time. Okay. So during the first five seconds. Okay. So notice that the delta t over here. Okay. The delta t over here, it is going to be five seconds. So every five seconds, you take the reading, right? So the time interval is going to be five seconds each, okay? Okay, now what I'm going to do here is, um, so during the first five seconds, uh, the velocity doesn't change very much, right? Because the time is so short, only five seconds. So the velocity doesn't change that much, okay? So you can think about, you can estimate the distance travel during that time by assuming the velocity at this reading is going to be constant. So during that time interval, we assume that to be constant because time interval is so small, five seconds, it doesn't change much. Let's assume that it's a constant, okay? So we can estimate that. Okay, so, and then you're going to take the velocity during that time interval, time interval to be the initial velocity, which is the 25, feet per second, and then you're going to times the time, which is five seconds, each time interval is five seconds. So rate times time give you this 125 feet. So the first five seconds, you travel about 125 feet. And you do the same with the second one. So you take the reading um, over here, okay? So at, in the beginning of the time interval, 31 feet per second, and you times the time times the time interval, which is five seconds. So you got this. And continue this way, okay? You can sum up the distance, you can sum up those, um, you can sum up the SMA for the distance travel in each sub-interval, each sub-time interval, okay? And it turned out to be one, <laughs> one, one, three, two, 1,130 feet, okay? <clears throat> Then that will be an estimate of how much distance you travel uh, during this um, 30 second time interval. <laughs> okay. And then instead of using the left endpoint, you can also use the right endpoint. Okay. So each time interval, you can take the right end. So you can use the velocity at the, at the end of the time interval times the time interval five seconds. And then you will do the similar process and you end up with this number over here. Okay, this number over here. Okay. So if you want a more accurate estimate, uh, we can take the time interval to be even smaller instead of five seconds. We can take every two seconds, okay? Or even every second, okay? Now the point over here is that we're trying to um, you try to get an idea, okay? The idea here is, suppose this is um, a velocity function, okay? This is a graph of velocity function. Uh, you can use the velocity, okay? So the problem we have this done over here is this. We use the velocity at, in the beginning and you times the time interval over here. So the velocity in the beginning over here, it is what? It is V0, right? And you times the time interval, which is five, five seconds, okay? And then later, you take the velocity over here, you times the time interval, which is five seconds again, 
oh, v, v of 5. Okay. And then we continue doing this. And then the last one here is the velocity at 25 seconds. And then we times the time interval over here, which is five seconds. And then turn out to be one, one, three, zero feet, right? We did that already, okay? So you see this delta t over here is equal to five seconds. So that's why the five here and here and also here. Okay, so using the left-hand point. Now you use the right end point. So you take the reading, the speed of the car at the, at the end of this, each time interval, okay? So this time we have, at this time interval, uh, ended at five seconds. So V5, we use V5 as the average velocity, okay? And then we times this by five, and then similarly V10, we times it by five, and continue in this process. What's, what's the last one? Can someone tell me what's the last one? V30? Yeah, you got it. So it is V30, the velocity at 30 seconds, and you times five, okay? What and we, did, we do the calculation, so that is going to be one, two, one, zero feet. All right, so, and then you can make the time interval to be even smaller and smaller, to be maybe every second, okay? Okay, repeat this process, okay? Now, now it's similar to the, our remind sum, okay? When you make the time interval to be even smaller and smaller, then the sum of those rectangles is going to be closer and closer to the area under the curve. So you see this one here actually correspond to the area of this rectangle. This corresponds to the area of this rectangle. This corresponds to area of this rectangle. So this is actually the sum of those area under the, it's the sum of those, and it's the sum of those six rectangle using the left hand point. This one here is actually correspond to the sum of those rectangle using the right, right hand point, okay? Now, when you make the time interval to be even smaller and smaller, then the area under the curve will be closer and closer to, the, then the sum of those rectangles will be closer and closer to the area under the curve. And the sum of this will be closer and closer to the exact distance that the car traveled. So you see that the area under the curve is actually correspond to the, the distance that the car traveled. So, the main point that this they want to show you is this, is this sentence here. The distance travel is equal to the area under the graph of the velocity function, okay? So what does it mean, okay? So over here, say this is for the time, okay, so, so this is for the time, and if the time go from A to B, okay? And you have this velocity over here. So this is the velocity function, and there's a graph. Then if you try to find this, so this area under the curve over here, this highlighted yellow part right here, this area over here is the distance travel. So corresponding to the area under the curve. Now, which makes sense, uh, let's try to think about when the velocity is actually a constant, right? So suppose we have a constant velocity. Then what happened over here from A to B? The time go from A to B. Then the distance travel over here will be the area under the curve will be this part right here, right? We will use the velocity times the time elapsed, okay? So velocity times the time that passed will give you the distance travel, okay? So that's the end of um, 5.1. Are you guys good? <laughs>